Commissioner, the next witness in this case study is Mr Alistair Welsh. Mr Welsh, uh, the oath which was administered now some days ago still persists. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr Welsh, have you received a summons to attend the Commission hearing today? Yes, I have. Do you have the original of that summons with you? Yes, I do. I attend to that summons. Exhibit 3.58, summons to Mr Welsh. Mr Welsh, have you prepared a statement in relation to rubric 310? Yes. Do you have any corrections to make to that statement? No, I don't. Are the contents of the statement true and correct? Yes. Do you have that statement with you? Yes, I do. I attend to the statement. The statement and its exhibits to, in response to rubric 3-10 is exhibit 3.59. Please, the Commissioner. Thank you, Mr Dark. Yes, Ms Orr. Uh, Mr Welsh, we've heard earlier in, the, earlier in the week that you are the General Manager of Commercial Banking at Westpac Business Banking. Is that right? Yes, it is. Thank you. Now, did you hear the evidence from Mr Bradley Wallace uh, in relation to two Westpac loans entered into by his company, Thur, yesterday? Yes, I did. Uh, and the loans were entered into with Westpac's Bank of Melbourne division. Is that right? Yes. And in your statement, you've addressed the circumstances surrounding the entry into and operation of these loans that were made to Mr Wallace's company? Yes. Uh, and in order to do so, you tell us in your statement that you examined the files and records held by Westpac and the Bank of Melbourne in relation to those loans? Yes. Uh, and you're familiar with those loans and the events that are the subject of Mr Wallace's evidence? Yes. Now, the Business Bank Division of Westpac operates under five different brands, is that right? Yes. Uh, to assist you, I think this, that they're yes, at St yes. George, um, Bank South Australia, Bank of Melbourne and Capital Finance Australia. Uh, and across each of those brands, Westpac offers business loans through a couple of different channels, is that right? Yes. Um, one channel is direct to Westpac through a Westpac branch or a business banking centre online or through the call centre. Yes. Uh, and the other is through Westpac's accredited brokers or aggregators. Yes. Uh, and a third channel is through intermediary referrers uh, such as tax advisors and accountants. Yes. And in the 12-month period up to the 30th, I'm sorry, up to the 20th of September 2017, you tell us in your statement that approximately 36% of Westpac's business lending came through a third-party referral. Yes. And the balance came directly um, through one of your direct customer contact points. Yes. Now, where a Westpac business loan is originated through a third party channel, uh, such as through a broker or a referrer, the third party's involvement in the loan origination process is limited to making the initial application or referral. Is that right? Uh, in some circumstances, yes. When it's not limited to that, what else does that person do? Uh, the it introduces typically would help the client prepare information, or sorry, help the client gather the information they need to do by asking the right questions to help them prepare the the package of documents yes. they might want to to give to the to the uh, to the banker. And after that package of documents is submitted, do they have any further involvement in the loan approval process? They may they have no involvement in the loan approval process because that's the banker's accountability to to write the submission. They may have involvement in providing information and be the conduit between the the bank and also the client. So who has the discussions with the customer about their needs and objectives uh, and verifies the information and does the customer serviceability assessments? So the banker is accountable for having the conversation with the customers, having accountability for writing the credit submission and for doing the serviceability. And verifying the information provided? And verifying the information provided. Okay, thank you. And in your statement, you've given evidence of Westpac's processes and policies that applied in 2016 
to the assessment and approval of loan applications made by SME customers for loans of less than $1 million. Is that right? Yes. And, and you tell us that aside from some streamlining and uh, amendments in response to the introduction of the unfair contract terms legislation and some guidelines published by the ABA, um, the processes and policies that applied in 2016 uh, remain much the same today? Yes. So under those policies and processes, when a new business customer first approaches Westpac, either through a, a third party broker or referrer, or direct to Westpac, um, unless they are what you call a micro SME customer, um, which means they have lending needs of less than $250,000, um, you give them a dedicated business banker. Is that right? Yes. And these business bankers are sometimes known as relationship managers or account managers? Yes. Uh, and for all Westpac business banking, including lending that comes through the, um, at the third party channel, it's the Westpac business banker that engages in the direct discussions with the customer about their lending needs um, and verifies their information and, as you say, undertakes the serviceability assessment. Yes. Okay. Um, and the relationship between the business banker and the customer, you tell us in your statement, is an important feature of Westpac's handling of applications for business loans. Yes. The business banker's role, you tell us, is to get to know the customer, to get to know the customer's business, to get to know the industry within which the customer's business operates, and to work closely with the customer to establish appropriate credit strategies that meet the customer's needs. Yes. And you've exhibited to your statement a copy of Westpac's policy document which sets out the roles and responsibilities of business bankers in relation to business lending. Yes. And that's uh, Exhibit 8 to your statement, um, WBC 400 And if we turn to the second page of that, I'm sorry, the third page, 8001, <coughs> we see there the confirmation of what you've been telling us, which is that these people who are described in this particular document as account managers um, are required by your policies, first dot point under account managers, to understand the customer's business and needs before offering finance and to verify the integrity of the customer and the information provided. Yes. Uh, and fifth dot point down, we see that they're required to understand the loan purpose, clearance source, and structure the exposure correctly. Yes. And sixth dot point, in supporting the proposal, they have to be satisfied that they know the customer, understand their business, and that there's no doubt about their integrity. Yes. And as I understand your evidence, where a customer is introduced to the bank by a third party, all of these requirements still apply. Yes. The business bank is required to meet directly with the customer, is that right? Yes. Uh, and the business bank is required by your policies to personally inspect the business premises. Uh, yes. Uh, and the business banker is also required by your uh, business bank third party introductions policy to attest to the fact that they have met the customer and visited their business premises and include that attestation with the credit submission. Um. Would you like me to show you the document that contains that requirement? It's the second exhibit you. to your statement. Uh, WBC 400 You recall this document, Mr Welsh? Uh, yes, I do. Sorry, what tab number was it? It's tab two in oh, your Oh, tab statement. two. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And if we turn to 8863 within that document... Mm -hmm. We see a table that tells us about the, the role of the account manager at Business Bank. Yes. 
and do you see the um, fifth dot point down <laughs> uh, include an attestation <laughs> with the credits within the credit submission that customer has been met and where applicable business premises visited using one of the following two forms of attestation yes, thank are you. provided. Thank you. Uh, so you accept that that's a requirement of your policies? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, now, the loans from the Bank of Melbourne to Mr Wallace's company were referred to the bank through a broker, weren't they? Yes, they were. Uh, and the broker submitted the loan application forms to the bank on behalf of the corporate entity applying for the loans? Yes. Uh, and in the application form for the buyer barra loan, you, you heard the evidence about the two different loans, the refinancing of the Port Macquarie investment property and the loan to acquire the buyer barra um, property for the business. So yes. I'll, I'll call that the buyer barra, barra. loan. Mm -hmm. um, in the application form for the buyer barra loan, um, Mr and Mrs Wallace indicated that the loan was sought for a business purpose. Yes. Um, now, can I just show you that commercial finance application form which I took Mr Wallace to yesterday? Mm -hmm. It's the first exhibit to your statement, WBC um, 4030010989. I'm sorry, it's the first exhibit to Mr Wallace's statement. It will come up on the screen, Mr Thank you. Welsh. I'm sure you've seen this document before. Yes, I have. Thank you. Um, now, you saw yesterday that I took Mr Wallace to this document, and in particular to the second page of this document, 0990, showing that what Mr and Mrs Wallace sought was a commercial loan in the sum of $560,000. Yes. And the purpose of the loan was as articulated by them at the bottom of this page, to purchase this property with a going concern restaurant, a five-star B&B. You recall that evidence? Yes, I do. And that was the information provided by Mr and Mrs Wallace through the broker? Yes. So from the time that the bank received this application form, it was on notice that the loan that Mr and Mol Mrs Wallace were seeking through their corporate entity uh, had a business purpose, being to fund the purchase of a property with a, a restaurant and a B&B &B operating on it? Yes, that's correct. Um, now, the bank also received a projected profit and loss statement from Mr Wallace for the business? Yes. And the Bank of Melbourne gave Mr and Mrs Wallace a dedicated business banker to deal with the application, is that right? Yes. And that was Mr Athanasopoulos? Yes. Uh, and Mr Athanasopoulos also dealt with their application to refinance the Port Macquarie property? Yes. And did Mr Athanasopoulos ever meet with Mr or Mrs Wallace? Uh, I, I don't know that. You, you heard I, Mr Wallace's evidence about this yesterday, that they did not meet? That's the uh, only evidence that I have from, from Mr Wallace. But you I don't... I don't. No evidence to I suggest no to the contrary? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's assume, uh, based on Mr Wallace's evidence, that there was no meeting between Mr and Mrs Wallace and Mr Athanasopoulos. If that's the case, um, why not? I don't know. That's something um, that you looked into when you were reviewing the file and preparing your statement? Yes, it was. Uh, and can you offer any explanation for why this business banker didn't meet with the clients? No, I can't. Um, the business premises were in New South Wales, is that right? That is correct. And Mr Athanasopoulos was located in Victoria? Yes. Is that unusual to have the business banker in one state and um, the business that's the subject of the loan in another state? Uh, it does happen, uh, but it's not, it's not normal. But uh, customers do at times make investments in other states, so that is, that is correct. Do you accept, based on your review of the file, that that was something that was picked up later within the Bank of Melbourne as an irregularity with this file? Can you just repeat the question? Do you accept that uh, later in the piece um, it was picked up within West, Westpac that this was an irregularity What's with this, this file? The, What's the this? This is that the location... The 
The location of the business banker was in Victoria and the location of the business was in another state, in New South Wales. Uh, yes, I do accept that. There was a note, I recall, in the file that said the client has moved to Queensland and the file should move, which is our normal practice. If a, if a client's moved and they're no longer Melbourne-based, then the file should uh, move to a banker that's closer to the client because it wouldn't make sense to, to have the Melbourne bankers still looking after that client. What about the fact that the business property was in New South Wales before they moved to the Gold Coast? The business that was the subject of this loan was in a different state, wasn't it? That is correct. Mm -hmm. um, it was a requirement, as you've acknowledged, of your policies that Mr Athanasopoulos inspect those premises? Yes. Okay. Um, do you know what Mr Athanasopoulos did to get to know Mr and Mrs Wallace, their business, um, the industry within which their business would operate and their needs generally? Uh, sorry, could you... Quite a few questions there. Um, one question one with question. a few elements. Do you yes. know what Mr Athanasopoulos did uh, to get to know Mr and Mrs Wallace? We'll, we'll do it in separate parts. Thank do you, you know what he did to... No, I don't. Um, do you know if he did anything to get to know Mr and Mrs Wallace? Oh, well, I heard from Mr Wallace have been a number of emails and a number of conversations, but other than that, I, I don't know. And do you know what he did to get to know their business? Uh, no, I don't. And do you know what he did to get to know the industry within which their business would operate? No, I don't. Okay. Um, uh, in your statement, you explain that one of the things that the business banker is required to do is to make a determination as to whether a business customer can meet their financial obligations under the proposed loan arrangements. Is that right? Yes, it is. And you say that in making that assessment, the business bank is expected to take into account a range of factors, including the customer's credit history, their management expertise, their vulnerability to external conditions <coughs> such as economic and political trends, technological changes and environmental risk. That, that's the list of matters that you include in your statement. Yes. And they're expected to take those matters into account um, because Westpac's policies require these matters to be taken into account in order to determine whether the business customer is likely to meet their financial obligations under the loan? Yes. Okay. Uh, and after the business bank has completed this assessment um, of their uh, ability to meet their financial obligations under the loan, they prepare a credit submission. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and that's provided to a credit officer? Yes. And the cr credit submission has to include information about the proposed facilities, the proposed securities, the purpose of the loan, and any key risks identified in connection with the business. Yes. Okay. Um, Westpac and Bank of Melbourne's approval procedure provides that for some loans of less than $500,000, the business banker themselves can approve the loan if they hold certain accreditations. Do you recall yes. telling us that in yes, your statement? Yes, um, And you also tell us in your statement that the average business loan uh, in Westpac is less than $500,000. Yes. Um, so what kinds of accreditations does a business banker need to hold in order to be able to improve, approve themselves without going to a credit officer a loan of less than 500,000? Uh, there's a varying degrees of accreditation to the various levels, and I outlined that in, in, in one of my statements. Uh, the important one here that I would like to make is that for new business, uh, the accreditation levels, for a new client, the accreditation levels are, are very low. And I've, from memory, I think they may have a banker at this level probably would have had no, no uh, credit approval authority to make a call on this deal because it was a new client, a new to Bank of Melbourne client. So do I understand you to mean by that, when you say the accreditation levels are very low, you mean that it is unusual for a business banker to hold an accreditation that would permit the business banker to approve lending to a new customer. Is that right? 
sorry, uh, the uh, accreditation levels are not low. <laughs> that was poor language by me. Yes. What I was trying to say is the threshold, the dollar threshold for the accreditation levels are, are lower uh, for new business. I think from memory it would, it would be zero for a new to Westpac or Bank of Melbourne business. So they would have had no credit approval authority to I be see. able to make this loan without going to a credit officer. I see. Because it's a new to bank, as we call it, business. Is that the case for any new business customer, that it, it needs to go, a credit submission needs to be made to a credit officer? Is that right? Yes. And that's what happened here with Mr and Mrs Wallace and their loan? Yes. Okay. They were new business customers? Yes. Okay. Um, now, in the situation where a business banker does have an accreditation that allows approval of a loan for less than $500,000, the loan submitted, you, you tell us in your statement, to an automated credit management system, mm -hmm. uh, which can auto-approve the loan subject to certain parameters. Yes. Um, in what circumstances can the loan be auto-approved? Uh, so... Auto-approved, uh, we look at a, a range of different measures, and typically we call it customer in good standing. Yes. So typically you're looking for, if there have been any overdrawn, if there been any default notices, you're looking to make sure that their transactional history shows uh, no abnormalities or anything that would bring to your concern. And then the uh, aut that would be the uh, auto decisioning, and that decision engine is running in the background all the time. So depending on the amount of money sought in the loan and the credit history and other matters you've just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, it may be that the loan can be approved via an automatic process. So I think I'm bundling a couple of things here. Um, there's the uh, auto decisioning, which is reviewing the file. Mm -hmm. uh, so re you're reviewing the client's connection as you... Uh, all the time. It's always working in the background. So that's one thing. When a client asks for new money yes. or some increased facilities, yes. then a banker would look at how much that is. If the customer is in good standing, that would be one of the requirements where they would apply their credit approval limit, their threshold, where they may, uh, may be able to do that. And it's typically for what we would call top up. Someone might say, I want a 50K overdraft to increase on my $500,000 limit. If the customer looks like they're in, in good shape and everything looks normal, to, we would allow the uh, banker to, under their credit approval authority, train to the right level to be able to, to approve that. So is that different to what you describe in paragraph 52 of your statement, which is about an auto approval? <coughs> or is that what you've just described? That would be if it was an existing customer. I see. It could, it could be in that situation. I see. So when the customer is a new business customer, uh, the credit submission has to be put to the credit officer. Yes. And the use of a separate credit officer uh, is an important internal control uh, to ensure that only those businesses that meet Westpac's policy requirements have loans approved? Yes. Um, and is it also to ensure that Westpac and the Bank of Melbourne uh, uphold their obligation under the Code of Banking Practice to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker when assessing and approving business loan applications? Uh, it, it is. It, it's a two-step process. Uh, I think it's less because of the Code of Banking Practice, but getting the origination right is the, is the critical part. Because as a new to bank customer, that's where you've got to find out all the information and get that right. Yes. In my experience, if you don't get the origination right, that's that's where it becomes a lot more challenging in the future. It's important to nail that original accreditation. And part of our controls and processes, you get an independent second line to, to make sure you sign that off. 
and getting the origination right, as you describe it, um, is consistent with exercising the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. Um, now, Mr Athanasopoulos referred a credit submission to a credit officer for the two loans that were sought by Mr Wallace's company, didn't he? Yes, he did. Um, and he had, <coughs> he had some difficulties in getting the buyer barra loan approved by the credit officer, didn't he? He had some difficulties? Some difficulties. The difficulties um, were connected with a valuation of the buyer barra property. Have you, have you seen references to this in the documents, Mr Welsh? Uh, I don't think... Yes, I have. And uh, what I'm hesitating, I don't think it was with a conversation with a credit officer. It was a conversation with someone else. OK. Uh, but that was part of the process of trying to approve the loan. Is that right? Yes, it was. Yes. And issues came up with evaluation of the buyer barra property. That is correct. Um, because the buyer barra property was going to be used as security for the loan, wasn't it? Yes. Um, and Westpac and Bank of Melbourne's policies required that any property that was going to be used as security for a loan um, was to be valued prior to the loan being approved? Yes. Okay. And a property that was going to be used as security for a loan um, could be either a residential property uh, or a commercial property? Yes. And the bank distinguishes between residential security properties uh, and commercial security properties because of the risks and characteristics of residential properties as opposed to commercial properties? Yes. Those risks are different, is that right? Yes, they are. Uh, in what way uh, are those risks different for residential and commercial properties? Well, the, the main way it's different on a commercial property is the analysis shows that there's more uh, cyclicality in the in the commercial property. So the prices can go up and down more. That's probably the first thing. Second thing is typically they would be for a special purpose. A commercial property might be for, in, in this case, it was a bed and breakfast. In other cases, it may be for a, a manufacturing business. So it's more specialised. Therefore, the potential for a buyer is uh, on a readily, readily market is limited. Probably the last point is a commercial property, you see a lot more capital investment, uh, capital expenditure to go in because you have to keep it upgraded to operate at the right level. So they're the three things that mean that it, it has a different risk profile. I see. And the Bank of Melbourne will generally only lend up to 65% of the value of a commercial property against which a loan secured, um, whereas it will lend up to 80% of the value of a residential property against which a loan secured. Is that right? That is right. And are they um, fairly standard loan LVRs, loan to value ratios across the industry? Yes, they are described as they would be described as standard. Yes. Um, now, could I take you to an exhibit to your statement, Exhibit 16, which is WBC 400-020-8408. Uh, this is Westpac and the Bank of Melbourne's policy at the relevant time in 2016 in relation to the valuation of securities, is that right? Mm -hmm. And if we turn to 8410, we see under the heading valuation requirements that a security valuation is undertaken for all assets held or offered as security. Yes. So the requirement to get a valuation is mandatory. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and <coughs> at 8411, we see a table setting out the acceptable valuation methods within Westpac and the Bank of Melbourne. Is that right? Yes. And perhaps if we could have the next page brought up on the screen next to that page so we can see the entirety of the uh, acceptable methods. Thank you. Um, the first valuation method listed is to use the contract of sale. Yes. And that's the purchase price listed in the contract of sale. Yes. But this document tells us that the circumstances in which 
um, evaluation is permitted to be carried out using the contract of sale are quite limited. Yes. Did, did you want to turn to this in your uh, statement no, no, as well? No, you have it I'm, there, I'm, Mr Welsh? No, uh, thank you. And is that because the use of a contract of sale to value a property is the least robust of these available valuation methods? It, it, it's, yes, that's one of the reasons. Okay, are there other reasons? Um, it's a also a risk-based call for once if the loan is smaller on that, then you want to try and uh, apply a risk-based assessment on that. But so using a contract of sale is, for a smaller loan, we deem uh, is appropriate. And that's consistent with what we see in the right-hand column, uh, parameters and requirements, because we see there that evaluation based on the contract of sale is only permitted where the purchase price is $600,000 or less? Yes and it's not permitted if the business customer is new to the bank. Do you see that down towards the end of the dot points there? Yes. And the more robust valuation methods, which are appropriate for new customers and for customers seeking to acquire a property with a purchase price in excess of $600,000, are the other types uh, listed here which include a panel valuer's report? Yes. Okay. Um, now, would a diligent, prudent and skilled lender only rely on a uh, contract of sale as the sole valuation method for an offered security uh, in circumstances where the customer was known to the bank, uh, had an established financial history and the purchase price didn't exceed the monetary threshold? Yes. Okay. Now here, for Mr and Ms. Mrs Wallace, the purchase price was in excess of 600000 wasn't it? Yes, it was. And Mr and Mrs Wallace and their corporate entity were not existing customers of Westpac? That is correct. Okay. So Westpac and the Bank of Melbourne's policy didn't permit evaluation of their security property via the contract of sale method? Yes, under this policy, but I do recall reading a Bank of Melbourne policy that the threshold was higher, but I can't recall where that is, sorry. This is what you've given us, yep. Mr Welsh, yep. as the applicable valuation policy at the time. Do you say now that there's a different one? I seem to recall something from a Bank of Melbourne policy, but I can't recall where that is, and I okay. can't recall whether I've got that in here. All right. Um, Within Westpac, you accept uh, the proposition I yes. put to you, is that right? Yes, I do. And you have some reservations about whether there might be another document that has a different monetary threshold for the Bank of Melbourne? Yes, that's correct. You can't recall what that monetary threshold is? I think it was as high as two million. Okay. And you don't have a document that shows us that? I can't recall in my bundle whether I do. Okay. Oh, and, and you apologies. have told us in your statement that this was the applicable valuation yes, yes. policy? Do you now think that might not be correct? Um, I, I recall seeing something that the Bank of Melbourne could go could have at a higher limit. All right. I just yeah. just to be fair, I just want to find the part of your statement where you deal with okay. this exhibit. Mm -hmm. 56, paragraph fifty six. Um, you've given us chapters of the business credit manual yes. relating to the assessment and approval of applications for business lending under $1 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a list there in paragraph uh, 56 of those policies, and they include the document I've just taken you to. Do you say that there's another document that should be in that list, Mr Welsh? I, I think they, they, m m sorry. I think there was uh, another policy for Bank of Melbourne that I'd, that I'd read. I didn't, uh, I looked at the Bank of Melbourne policy and not this one, so I may have, and it looks like I've excluded that. You have, because yes. under uh, subparagraph I, what you've given us for valuations is Exhibit 16. It is indeed. I've taken you to. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to look at what happened with the valuation of the Biobara property. Mm -hmm. uh, can I take you to a document which is WBC 4030027400? Have you 
seen this document before, Mr Welsh? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, so it's a screenshot provided to the Commission um, by Westpac of a sequence of events relating to the valuation of the Bayabara property. Is that right? Yes, it is. And we see there, if we deal with this um, chronologically and start at the bottom of the table, we see that on the 4th of May 2016, a few days after the loan documents were submitted by the broker, you might recall on th the 30th of April 2016, we see that on the 4th of May, um, uh, one of the bank's panel valuers, Taylor Byrne, is asked to value the property. Do, we, do you see there? Accept yes, for accepted yes, valuation. And the following day, the 5th of May 2016, Ms Banning, a representative of the valuer, advises that they can't value the property because it requires a commercial valuation. Yes. And therefore they needed a fee to conduct it. Is that right? Or is that the fee that they're charging to get to the point of telling you that it needs a commercial valuation? I hope not. <laughs> so do you understand that to be a request for payment of a fee in order for them to conduct a commercial valuation? Yes. Okay. And about a week later, on the 11th of May, we see an entry from Mr Athanasopoulos asking that the valuation be allowed to proceed ASAP. Settlement is due in June. And on the same day, another entry from Mr Athanasopoulos, where he notes that the property is fundamentally a rural home and has a small ship, which I assume means shop, unless you know something about the property that I don't, Mr Welsh. No, I don't. Um, please note this property is fundamentally a rural home and has a small shop on it. It is not a commercial property. Do you see that entry, I Mr do. Welsh? I do. Do you know why Mr Athanasopoulos made that entry? No, I don't. Well, it was a commercial property, wasn't it? In my view, it was, yes. And Mr Athanasopoulos knew from the documents submitted by Mr and Mrs Wallace that they were buying it not only to live there, but to take over the business that was currently being operated on the property. Uh, sorry, can you that just... Was, so that was apparent to Mr Athanasopoulos from the documents submitted by Mr and Mrs Wallace uh, that... Mr and, Mrs. Wallace's, Mr and Mrs Wallace were buying this property not only to live there, but to take over the business that was currently operating on the property. Uh, that's not my understanding. That's not your understanding? Correct. Could you explain that? Um, the first part of your statement there, that it was the understanding that they were going to live there... Yes. Uh, I didn't see evidence from the file that they were going to live there. I see. So you agree with me that it was apparent from the documents that they uh, submitted that they intended to take over the business operating on the property? Yes. Okay, I see. And that was why they'd applied for a business loan? Yes. But you didn't see documents recording that they were going to reside on the property? Yes. That's the distinction you're making? <coughs> yes, thank I you. I see. Um, okay. Then... If we return to this document, we see that on the same day as Mr Athanasopoulos's second entry, Ms Banning, the representative of the valuer, says this is a commercial property. The purchase price is not of a residential nature and includes value attributed to the business. Property is known as Blue Poles Cafe, Bed and Breakfast and Residence. So that was the communication back from the valuer in response to Mr Athanasopoulos's um, residential characterisation of the property? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to pause there in the chronology uh, and go to another document. And before I do that, I'll tender this document, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.60, screenshot uh, events concerning Barbara property, 4 to 17 May 16, WBC 4030027400. Now, just uh, before that document goes off the screen, um, Mr Welsh, I'll just ask you to note that the last entry we've looked at is the entry dated the 11th of May 2016, because I'm about to show you a document a few days Sorry, later. Last last entry I've taken Mr Welsh to oh. is the 11 May. I will come back to yes. this document because there's an intervening event between the 11th of May and the 17th of May.
Can I ask that you now be shown WBC 4030062322. So this is an email chain from a few days later on the 16th of May 2016. <coughs> uh, it's an uh, email that shows us on the first page an email from Mr Athanasopoulos to Mr Damien Brander within the Bank of Melbourne and there is a second page which perhaps we could have brought up on the screen with this page. We'll start with that email which is the first in the chain. Uh, so on the 16th of May 2016 on the right hand side of the screen Mr Welsh Yes. We see an email from a person who was the broker who had um, put the documents in on Mr and Mrs Wallace's behalf. Is that right? That's my understanding. Yes, and the broker was writing to Mr Athanasopoulos. Hi, Arthur. Can we please get a move on this one? NAB has given them conditional approval of 492 k on a commercial loan for the full purchase price, i.e. the property and the business combined contracts. Yes. Okay. Uh, so that's conditional approval for a commercial loan, we see from that email. And that comes through on the 16th of May. And then in response, we see that Mr Athanasopoulos sends the email on the left-hand side of the page uh, to Mr Brander. Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay. And Mr Brander was Mr Athanasopoulos's superior, is that right? Yes. He was his regional general manager? Yes. Okay. Uh, and Mr Athanasopoulos told Mr Brander, uh, I'm having difficulties with getting this deal approved. Do you see that at the top? Yes, I do. And in the second paragraph, he refers to the main issues. And the second of those is valuers struggling with valuation as the rural residential zone property is being considered as commercial as it also has a small shop on the far corner of the property. Do you see that? Yes, I do. I want to put to you that that's a somewhat misleading statement, isn't it? Because the valuer had told Westpac a few days before that this was a commercial property uh, with a purchase price that included value attributed to the business that was being operated on the property. Yes. So do you accept that that statement by Mr Athanasopoulos is misleading to Mr Brander? Yes. And we see from this email that Mr Athanasopoulos was troubled by the conditional approval that had been given to these potential clients by NAB. Yes. We see him saying to Mr Brander, the NAB has offered the client as attached and conditioned it whilst we try to dot our I's and cross our T's before we even know if the deal will be approved. And in fact, the client setup is actually required. The clients need to know if we can approve and I cannot do that until a val is done and the ID issue, which was an unrelated issue, was completed. He goes on to say, wouldn't it be wise to take our competitors out of the market so we can proceed with getting everything we need from the client prior to settlement rather than leave things open. Some brokers are shaking their heads, stating why will their clients go through all that process without an approval. Um, he goes on to say, uh, what can we do quickly? This is down towards the bottom of the page. Mm -hmm. What can we do quickly before we miss out on a good deal? And furthermore, can we action this to ensure smarter actions are taken to get our offers out to the clients and brokers before our competitors get in front of us? Yes, I see that. Um, it's fair to say that Mr Athanasopoulos was very keen to get this deal done. That's my read as well. Uh, and that was because, wasn't it, he stood to gain financially if this loan was approved? He may have, but yes. His regional manager, Mr Brander, would have also stood to gain financially if the loan was approved? He may have, yes. The approval of this loan impacted on the eligibility of both uh, Mr Athanasopoulos and Mr Brander uh, for their bonuses, didn't it? it? It would have been a contributor. Yes. Uh, and could I ask, um, I'll tender that document and show you another. 
Exhibit 3.61, emails between Athanasopoulos, Brander and others, 16 May uh, 16, WBC 4030062322. I could ask that you be shown WBC 10700310089. Have you seen this document before, Mr. Welsh? Uh, no, I haven't actually. It's a document annexed to one of the statements that Ms. Saparovich has made to this commission. Okay. Have you seen those yes. statements? Yes, I have. Uh, so I this have. is the second exhibit to Ms. Saparovich's statement relevant Thank you. to this yes, case. Yes, I have seen that one. I just didn't recognise the front. Okay. Um, now, it's a copy of the KPIs that applied to local business managers uh, in the period from the 1st of October 2015 to the 30th of September 2016. Yes. Uh, and Mr Athanasopoulos was a local business manager? Yes. Uh, and that period covered by this document covers the time when Mr Athanasopoulos was trying to get this deal done? Yes, it does. Okay. Can I just ask that you turn to 1090? And we see there the scorecard that applied to Mr. Athanasopoulos. Um, we see there that sales and financial targets made up 70% of Mr. Athanasopoulos's KPIs. Yes, that's correct and they included 40% for revenue growth? Yes. And that was the growth in revenue over Mr Athanasopoulos's total <coughs> portfolio? Yes. 20% uh, for asset growth? Yes. The growth in asset balances over his total portfolio? Yes. And 10% for deposit growth? Yes. So these were the financial gateways that needed to be satisfied for local business managers such as Mr Athanasopoulos to participate in Westpac's variable reward program? These were the... So can you just repeat the question? I think. Were they the financial gateways uh, that needed to be satisfied by local business managers like Mr Athanasopoulos uh, to participate in Westpac's variable reward program. These were the financial metrics they had to achieve? Yes. Yes, correct. Now, I, the language I've used is taken from paragraph six of Ms Saparovich's statement. I'm familiar with it yes. broadly. Yes. All right. Um, if we look at the final column of this table, we see at this time, uh, in order to meet these requirements, Mr Athanasopoulos was required to meet 90% of his uh, revenue growth target. Do you see that from the right-hand side? Yes. And he had to meet 80% of his asset growth and deposit growth targets. Yes. So you accept, do you not, Mr Welsh, that at the time Mr Athanasopoulos was trying to get this loan approved, his KPIs were heavily weighted towards his financial performance? His KPIs were weighted to his financial performance, yes. Thank you. And you accept they applied to Mr Athanasopoulos? I do indeed. Yes. Um, I, I don't need to tender that document because it is part of Ms Saparovich's statement. But I want to understand, uh, Mr Welsh, if business bankers have target markets. <coughs> if business bankers have target markets? Target market. markets. Uh, Can you give me a little your reference to that? Yes, I'll show you a document Please. in which that term is used yes. uh, and you can help me try and understand what it means. Thank you. Uh, uh, the document is WBC 4030020398. Now... Uh, do you see at the bottom of the page there, this is an email chain uh, between various people yes. within the Bank of Melbourne who are discussing the potential approval of this loan. Do you see an email from Lorraine Handley at the bottom of the page on the 20th of May 2016? Hi Maria, BLAST approved. BLAST is 
well, perhaps you can explain, what is BLAST? BLAST is the original origination system for the St George Group, which includes Bank of Melbourne. BLAST approved regards Lorraine. Proposal is within target market for this business banker. So that would be referring to the level of debt. And what does that mean? What is the level of debt that was Mr Athanasopoulos's target market? So uh, in my statement, I talked about the fact that the over 250 lending up to the 3 million lending yes. is the target market for the L LBBs or LBMs for I Bank see. of Melbourne. So that would have been the type of the debt criteria for the type of client that, that he would have been uh, looking at. So does that mean that uh, Mr Athanasopoulos and other people at his level uh, were expected or encouraged to sell loan products um, for loans within uh, that bracket? But they were accredited to that level. I see. And it was their market that they were targeted towards. I see. I yes. understand. Uh, could I tender that document, Commissioner? Uh, emails between Handley O'Toole and others, 20 May uh, 16 WBC 4030002398 is exhibit 3.62. Um, now, in the email that we looked at earlier from Mr. Athanasopoulos to Mr. Brander, in which mm. Mr. Athanasopoulos was putting the case to get this deal done, um, Mr. Athanasopoulos, <coughs> in his role at that time, would have known that if the property was characterised as a commercial property, uh, the bank would only lend up to 65% of the value of the property. Is that right? That is right. Um, whereas if it was characterised as a residential property, the bank would lend up to 80%. That is correct. Um, so that because he wanted to get the deal done and ensure the clients didn't take the other deal with NAB, um, he pressed, despite the information from the valuer, for this property to be characterised as a residential property. Yes, okay. that's my view. All right, can I return to the screenshot that we had before just to see the final steps in the valuation process? That was WBC 4030027400. Uh, that email we had been looking at was the 16th of May, uh, Mr Welsh. And if we return to the final part of this table, we see on the 17th of May, the day after, the request for evaluation was cancelled on the basis that the valuation was not proceeding through this channel. Is that right? Yes. Uh, I want to put to you that this was done to get around the valuer's characterisation of the property as being a commercial property and avoid the limit on the amount that the bank could offer to lend if it was valued as a commercial property. That's, yes, yes, I think that is correct. Mm -hmm. And in your statement, you tell us that the loan was instead assessed um, based on a valuation using the sale price in the contract of sale. Yes. Uh, and that was $645,000. Yes. And that was done even though the criteria for using that valuation method in the policy were not met. Yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> Westpac proceeded to value the property contrary to its own policy. Um, that was a risky thing to do, wasn't it? Uh, Westpac, uh, so our banker here made the wrong call, mm. and they, in my view, this should have been a, this was a commercial property, and this should have been valued as a commercial property. I'm not sure what else went on in the conversations, but this is a factual record of, of no. that period. I'm not sure what else may have gone on in discussions there. Yes, I see. So you accept that he made the wrong call? I do. Yes, yes I, see. I do. All right. Uh, can we turn to the loan documentation briefly, which is exhibited to your statement as Exhibit uh, 30, um, <laughs> WBC 4030020149. Uh, 
Uh, all, all I want to ask you about this document, Mr Welsh, um, is uh, you've read this document and you understand that uh, the loan was secured. This is the um, Port Macquarie loan that I'm taking you to at the moment, not the Buyer Barra loan. I'll come to the Buyer Barra one. Um, the Port Macquarie loan was secured by the Port Macquarie investment property. Yes. And each of Mr and Mrs Wallace signed a guarantee and an indemnity for that loan. They did. And if we turn then to the Buyer Barra uh, loan agreement, which is Exhibit 32 to your statement, um, we see that the amount that was offered to uh, Mr and Mrs Wallace for the Buyer Barra purchase was $516,000. Yes. It was secured over the Buyer Barra property. Yes. And again, there were guarantees and indemnities signed <coughs> by Mr and Mrs Wallace. Yes. Can you offer any explanation for why this was a residential loan agreement offer? Yes. What's the explanation? So the purpose of the loan was for business purpose. Yes. And that was well documented. Under our policies, you are allowed to have a consumer loan for business purpose with residential security. So there's three steps there. It's, I understand. It's a, the, the central one is, a, yes, it is a business purpose, consumer loan with residential property. Um, so you say this was an available way of doing this deal, to use a residential loan agreement? It was. But the wrong call that the banker made was in the valuation of the security property. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Uh, in proceeding on the basis that the security property was residential rather than commercial? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, uh, and that the immediate consequence of that was on the amount of money uh, that the bank was prepared to lend to Mr and Mrs Wallace? Yes. Okay. Now, I, I want to take you to events after the loan is approved. Uh, in June 2017, I'm, which is I about... I go back to... You said that the purpose of the loan was a business purpose? Yes. You said that you can use a consumer loan for business purposes with residential security? Yes. What was the residential security in this transaction? The residential security in this transaction would have been the buyer bar of property. If that had, and as in my view, that is a commercial property, therefore you, you would not have been able to have a consumer loan because you can't have a consumer loan for business purposes with commercial property. So that would have been documented as a business loan, uh, a business purpose, and therefore a business loan with commercial property security. Yes. Yes. And the 65% LVR should have applied. I, I'm, I'm grateful to you, Commissioner, for clarifying that because <laughs> I think your evidence now is that this wasn't an available um, way of dealing with this loan, it should have been a business loan secured by the commercial property. In my view, it should have, yes. Yes, I see. yes that's, that's my, my evidence that yes. that's the case. Yes, thank Because you. the banker picked that it was, said that it was a residential, that's why this option was applied. So but it was, was not. This was an, a second misstep on the part of the business banker. Is that right? Uh, it's the same misstep, I, I think, because because of the classification that it was residential, that led to the the consumer loan option for business purposes being available, which should not have been, which should not have been 100% right. I understand. Thank you. Yes. Um, and can I now turn to the events uh, okay. after the loan? Mm -hmm. um, I was taking you to June 2017, which is about 12 months in to yes. the life of the loan. Um, the Bank of Melbourne received a request from Mr Wallace to revalue the two security properties, the Port Macquarie investment yes. property and the Buyer Barra property. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Uh, and you heard Mr Wallace's evidence that they did this because they were considering borrowing against any additional equity that accrued, had accrued uh, to buy a home on the Gold Coast. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in your statement at paragraph 102... <coughs> Do you 
see there, I'm sorry, here we are at 102, you tell us that in the course of arranging for the revaluation, a member of the credit team identified that the buyer Barra property had been characterised as a residential property, where in fact it was considered likely that it should have been characterised as commercial. Yes. Well, the effect of your evidence today is that um, the bank was aware at the time that it advanced the loan that the buyer Barra property was unlikely to be characterised as residential and should have been characterised as commercial from the start. Do you accept that? Yes, I do. Because the bank's own panel valuer had told the bank this? Um, yes. Uh, so why, why have you chosen to express it this way in your statement? So, sorry, can you just, why have I just look, I'm just confused with the question. I just want to be clear, in case there's any ambiguity about the way you've expressed this paragraph, mm -hmm. I want to be clear as to whether or not you accept that the bank knew back at the origination stage that this was a commercial property and ought to have been valued as such. I understand where you're going. Do, do you agree with that? So, I, what I was, what our banker did at the original origination was they, as you highlighted through this, had a disagreement with the valuer. Mm -hmm. The banker knew that the valuer was saying it was a commercial property. Yes. That is correct. Yes. The banker had some narrative there to say that it was a residential property and there was some narrative there that said they'd spoken to CMT, which is the, I understand to be the consumer uh, mortgage team, the, sorry, the uh, credit mortgage team. So the banker was aware, you are correct. I'm not sure who else was aware at that point in time. Was Mr Brander aware? Mr Brander aware, was aware there was a debate going on. Was he aware that it ought to have been characterised as a commercial property? I don't know what he... And I what about know. the credit officer? I don't believe the credit... From my read of the file, I don't believe the credit officer was. I see. The, when I read the credit memo that you referred to earlier, I, I, it implied there was going to be an evaluation sought and it wasn't clear, it wasn't disclosed there to a credit officer that this was a commercial property and they were... Uh, the, the, yes, that it was a commercial property. So I don't believe the credit officer was aware. So just trying to chunk down who the bank is in this situation. Yes, so the person dealing directly with the customer was aware? Yes, in my view. Yes, okay. Now, having received this um, request for a revaluation of the security properties, uh, the bank tried to order a valuation for both of the properties, is that right? Yes. Uh, and just before I move to that, if I could just have a moment. Could I just ask you, I just want to take up a point from the evidence you've just mm -hmm. given, Mr Welsh, from the uh, uh, notes um, involving the credit officer. Can I ask that you be shown a document which is FOS 0015 0001 0502? The distinction I want to draw here when this document comes up, Mr Welsh, is um, I think you're going to say that you don't know um, to whom within the bank beyond Mr Athanasopoulos the view of the valuer was communicated. Is that right? That is right. Um, but I want to put to you that that wasn't the only way of the people with, for the people within the bank to understand that this was a business property that ought to have been valued as a business property. Do you accept that? Let's work on that hypothesis. Yeah, well, well let's start in that <laughs> hypothesis with the documents that were submitted to the okay. bank by Mr and Mrs Wallace, all of which referred to um, the business that they intended to operate on the property. Yes. Um, yes. They would have all gone uh, to the credit officer? Not necessarily. So what would the credit officer have got? 
the credit officer would have got the submission from the, the banker, okay. with the banker's evidence. All right. So this document that I have on the screen at the moment is from the Bank of Melbourne system. It's a summary of internal notes on the system. And if we turn to 0510, we see partway down the page a recommendation created by Maria O'Toole. We saw Maria O'Toole's name on one of the other emails. Do you recall mm -hmm. that, Mr Welsh? Yes, I do. And there's an entry here about the nature of the business. And do you see the second paragraph down? The two have purchased an investment property in 2015 and have offered bank opportunity to refinance this and support their new purchase. Um, they hope to buy the property, now this is the buyer Barra property, which has a tenantable house and separate shop. Land is zoned residential. Yes. So this is the sort of information that the credit team had. They were aware of the commercial enterprise on the property, weren't they? Yes. Okay. So would they have been surprised that this was packaged up as a residential loan? Uh, the, I, I think the important part here that they might have read through is that land is zoned residential. So that though it has a business on it, it's zoned residential, and I think that's where the the error may have. What does occurred. that have to do with anything, Mr. Welsh? You can operate a business, can you not? Yes, on, you can. On property that's zoned residential. Yes, you can. The important thing is that they were being told about the intent of the um, borrowers um, to operate a business. Yes. So, it's, so that goes to the business purpose. There was no doubt that this was a business purpose. Yes. And, and the credit officer yes. would have known that the security property was the property from which the business would be operated. That was clear to the credit officer, wasn't yes. it? Yes, yes. Okay. So yeah. would it have surprised the credit officer to see this packaged as a residential loan? Not necessarily. Why not? Because... Uh, that well, Maybe if I take the other loan that we've got to Port Macquarie, that was a that was still a business purpose loan, and it was a house, so it was residential. So that was clearer, mm. correct? Mm -hmm. In this one, depending on how much information they had of how much was business and how much was was residential, the I, I my view of the file is that they could have thought that because it was land is zoned residential that a residential security was appropriate. In my view, it wasn't appropriate. Mm. And with more information, my pick is the credit officer would have made the call that it should have been a commercial property. Mm. I think the information was scanned. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if that was the call they made, and we don't know, that was the wrong call? Agreed. Yes. All yes. Right. I tender that document, yes. Commissioner. What do I describe it as, Ms. Uh, it's um, internal uh, Westpac notes. I don't know if Mr. Welsh has another way of explaining what it is. Uh, generated from the Westpac credit. Is it a credit yeah, system? I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Internal notes, uh, Westpac or Bank of Melbourne, uh, uh, Mr. Welsh, is it? A Bank of Melbourne. Internal Melbourne. notes, Bank of Melbourne, uh, FRS 0015-0010502, Exhibit 3.63. Uh, I want to come back to the bank's attempts to value the property after Mr Wallace's request for a revaluation in June 2017. Um, can I ask that you be shown WBC 4030071202? And uh, can I show you the email at the bottom of the page from May Zhao to Mr Wallace on the 10th of July? Hi Brad, I've just ordered the valuation through residential channel for your property at Bayer Barra. Since this property is used as security for your home loan, our system only allows me to order residential valuation. If the valuer comes back to us advising they couldn't not complete res valuation due to business on site, we'll let you know what to do next. Uh, so Ms Zhao already seemed concerned that 
the yes. valuation wouldn't happen because of the business on the property and therefore it being a commercial property. Correct. Uh, and then if we stay on that page, the next email up the chain is an email from Ms Zhao to Mr Wallace later that day. And as Ms Zhao anticipated, the valuer um, has requested that the valuation be cancelled because it needs to be done as a commercial valuation. And she says that she'll get three quotes for the valuation through the commercial channel and let Mr Wallace determine which one to go for. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Emails between May Zhao and Wallace, uh, 10 July 17, WBC 4030071202, uh, Exhibit 3.64. So the effect of this was that Mr Wallace would need to pay for the valuation because the bank doesn't pay for commercial valuations, is that right? That is correct. And how much does a commercial valuation tend to cost? Uh, it varies. Uh, we well, we saw earlier that there was a 3,000... Uh, there was a reference to 1,000 1, plus 1, in plus. one of the emails. Yes. Um, and Mr Wallace elected not to pay for a commercial valuation. You heard his evidence I about did. that yesterday. Yes, yes I did. Uh, and um, uh, we've seen that the result of uh, the conduct earlier in the piece at the origination stage... Um, was that the Bank of Melbourne had lent Mr Wallace and Mrs Wallace 80% of the contract of sale value over the buyer barrow property. That was the 516. Is that right? Yes, correct. Um, and if it had been assessed as a commercial security, it would have only lent 65%, which would be $419,000. That's correct. Okay. Um, so that meant that there was a security shortfall on the loan of just under $100,000. Yes. And in August 2017, there was a discussion within the bank about the need to change the loan product for the buyer barrow property from a home loan to a business loan and address that security shortfall. Yes. Okay. And if I could take you to WBC 4030011118. Uh, these are another set of internal Bank of Melbourne notes. Have you seen this document before, Mr Yes, Walsh? I have. Yes. And if I could ask you to look at 1127. We see there that as at the 14th of August 2017, these notes show that questions were being asked internally about why a home loan facility had been provided for a commercial secure, secured property. That's correct. And if we turn to the next page, 1126, we see an internal note from the 22nd of August 2017 at 1126. Towards the bottom of the page, the 22nd of August 2017, recording that the LVR was not within the bank's underwriting standards. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, and the clients therefore needed to provide either a sale contract of property being sold and or contribute to funds to reduce the LVR to 65%. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Advance application file WBC 4030011118, Exhibit 3.65. And we know that on the 26th of September 2017, Mr and Mrs Wallace sent a request to the bank to discharge the mortgage over the Port Macquarie investment property on the basis that they'd sold that property. Yes. Uh, now... Coming back to these internal notes, if we could turn to 1126 again, uh, we see there uh, an internal note from the 27th of September in the middle of the page. We are discharging the below property as client is selling the property for over 600,000. Um, property be to be discharged, it's the Port Macquarie property. Uh, and then if we look above that at the note on the 28th of September, 
uh, a credit officer says, as discussed with Regional General Manager Damien Brander, we need to amend the following thing as mentioned below. From the sale proceeds, we need to hold 97,000 as term deposit for the B2 facility remaining. B2. I think it's blast recommend. I'm not 100% sure. But in any event, it was a reference to the Biobara facility. That's, yes, I assume that too. Product needs to be needs to change to a business loan facility in line with security. Yes. Valuation to be by a commercial panel valuer confirming MV of the property, and if any amounts exceed 60, 65% LVR, will need to be cleared from the 97,000 being held as security. Yes. Um, and we see from the line underneath. Uh, the 97,000 is being provided as collateral until valuation is received and satisfactory LVR are met along with product change as confirmed. Yes, I do see that. All right. Now, continuing in that chronology, on that same date, the 28th of September, there was an email from Mr Brander to Mr Wallace, which you've annexed to your statement as Exhibit 46. Now, if we turn to 4067, you'll see an email there that I took Mr Wallace to yesterday. You may have heard when I read this email out yesterday, an email from the 28th of September that refers to a telephone conversation that Mr Brander has had with Mr Wallace and his commitment from our state credit officer, this is the email at the bottom of the page, our com a commitment from our state credit officer to approve the sale discharge re re request, which we will look to complete <coughs> next Friday, on the condition that we hold 100,000 of the sale proceeds in a term deposit, we will release the term deposit when the new business loans are in place to correctly secure the bank's post-settlement position. Yes. See that? Yes, I do. Uh, and um, I think you heard uh, the emails that I took Mr Wallace to yesterday showing the subsequent exchange that occurs between Mr Brander and Mr Wallace. Yes, I did. Could I ask you to look at another of your exhibits, which is Exhibit 44, uh, WBC 4030063487. We see there an email from uh, Mr Miller, a business banking manager, to Mr Wallace on the 5th of October, telling Mr Wallace that partial discharge settlement has been approved subject to a condition precedent. Do you see that? I do. The term deposit from the sale proceeds for 100,000 is to be taken as additional collateral until satisfactory commercial valuation is received with loan to value ratio of 65% is confirmed and or cash funds to be used to reduce overall funding in line with loan to value ratio of 65%. Now, yes, I see that. the decision to take this approach to hold the $100,000 as collateral had been approved by the Bank of Melbourne's credit team? Yes. Uh, now, could I ask that you look at another document, which is WBC 4030011737. And we see this is an email from uh, Joel Gatton, or Gatton, I'm sorry, Jatton Goal, G O E L. At 1738, I need to take you to first, um, Mr. Welsh. Mm -hmm. Mr. Goal, or possibly Ms. Goal, I'm not sure, uh, is a lending specialist. We see there from the footer of the email, a small business lending specialist. And this person says to a group of people, including um, the credit officer, whose name we saw on some of the previous internal notes, Ronnie Suwani. Um, we're not formally taking the TD, the term deposit, as security. It's just there for comfort 
pending the valuation of the property coming back. So we know where we stand from a security perspective, which should be in the next few days. You see that? I do. And in the paragraph below that, second sentence, really sorry to be escalating this one when all the delays were before it got to you, but the issues weren't the customer's fault either, and we just want to do what we can to make the best of a bad situation. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, so th this email confirms, doesn't it, that the bank's decision to require the term deposit to be created to hold the $100,000 from the proceeds of sale from the Port Macquarie property was taken to try and bring about a solution to a problem caused by the bank's own conduct and not by any fault on the part of Mr Wallace. Yes, that's correct. All right, thank you. I tender that document, Commissioner. Emails between Goal, Condor and others, October 2017, WBC 4030011737, Exhibit 3.66. Could I ask that you be shown WBC 4030011742? It's an email chain from October when it comes up, Mr Welsh. The last email was the 6th of October and this email is the 19th of October. Thank you. We'll see it when it comes up, but I can ask the question Please. anyway, Mr <laughs> Welsh, which is uh, you'll see in this document when it comes on the screen yep. that there is an internal request to ask business servicing team to put a hard hold on this term deposit. Could you explain what a hard hold is? Uh, my understanding is it would be that you're not allowed to make a withdrawal from it. Okay. So I, that's how I read that document when I saw it. So the $100,000 was to be in a term deposit in Mr and Mrs Wallace or their corporate entity's name, but they were not going to be permitted to access it? Yes, correct. Thank you. I tender that document, Commissioner. Emails between Lee and Zhao, 19 October 17, WBC 4030011742, Exhibit 3.67. Can I just take you um, back to the extended email chain between Mr Brander and Mr Wallace in the days that follow this? I just want to ask you a couple of questions by reference to that. It's the one that I took Mr Wallace through yesterday. It's Exhibit 46 in your statement. Um, we, we started with the initial communication in September 2017. Yes. Uh, now, you would have heard that uh, these emails show that Mr Wallace requested information from Mr Brander about the legal right of the bank to hold the $100,000. Yes, I did. Uh, and you can see from 4066... Uh, and an email from Mr Brander to Mr Wallace on the 19th of October, which appears on the bottom of that page, uh, that in response to that request, Mr Brander uh, tells Mr Wallace that he's going to provide him with a copy of the contractual documents, uh, but he has to retrieve them and it might take some time. Yes, I do see that. So we can take from that that um, at the time Mr Brander is communicating with Mr Wallace about these matters, um, he has not himself reviewed the contractual documents. I, I don't know what he reviewed, sorry. Well, we can see that he hasn't retrieved yep. the contractual documents from storage yet. Yes, he had. He hadn't? He, uh, uh, that's my read of that as well. He needed to get them from, from storage. Yes, so do you understand on what basis he was asserting to Mr Wallace that the $100,000 could be held in a term deposit that they could not access at this stage? I don't understand it fully. Uh, however, there may be an explanation, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And we see that subsequently, um, Mr Brander, after some days, uh, retrieves those documents and sends copies to Mr Wallace. Yes, we do. And he identifies certain clauses within one of those documents, which is the Memorandum of Provisions for the mortgage? Yes. Is that right? Have you reviewed those provisions that uh, Mr Brander referred Mr Wallace to? Uh, I, yes, I have. 
uh, and you've annexed the memorandum of provisions for the Port Macquarie mortgage yes. as part of Exhibit 31 to your statement. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't annexed the memorandum of provisions for the Via Barra mortgage, but mm -hmm. they were entered into at the same time. Can we, <coughs> can we assume that they would be in the same form? Yes. Can you direct us to the clauses of the memorandum of provisions that permitted the bank to retain $100,000 of the proceeds of sale from the Port Macquarie property and place it in a term deposit that was not accessible by Mr and Mrs Wallace? So how I worked through this, and it might be a good way of looking at it, was I, uh, I looked at our information that our lawyers, and I think our lawyers would have internal lawyers or internal uh, mortgage team would have provided Mr Brandis with some of this information. I, I wouldn't have expected Mr Brandis to have gone and read through all the documents and make the call. I would have wanted an independent judgment. So if I assume that, that just, was one thing. Pausing there, um, yes, because please. that's an important assumption. Yes. Do we see anything in any of the documents that you have provided to indicate that that occurred? No, I don't. So why do you assume that that happened? Uh, because the, it got quite technical here. In my experience of a, rela uh, a regional general manager, if they got into this situation, is they wouldn't be relying on their own judgment to go and read documents and debate with clients. They'd get support from either the, um, more, the credit team or the legal team because you want to get it right and you'd be relying on lawyers and people with expertise to, to help get this right. But there's no evidence that Mr Brander relied on any lawyers, <laughs> is there? There's no evidence? That Mr Brander relied on any lawyers before making this communication uh, to Mr Wallace. Oh, internal legal team. Sorry, I, I, have, have you seen I, I've made, I, so I made an assumption that that's what he'd done. And Bec my question is, have you seen any documents to suggest that that occurred? No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, so it's not a particularly safe assumption then, is it, Mr Welsh? Oh, I didn't see any evidence. You're correct. Right. Okay. Um, well... Let's stick with your assumption, and even though there are no documents to suggest that anything of that nature happened, mm -hmm. let's assume that Mr Brander did get some legal mm -hmm. advice about this to identify some clauses. My question to you, having reviewed these documents yourself, is where in this document do we see the bank's entitlement to act as it did? Uh my review of I, I have read the documents. My review of this was informed by the FOS decision, so I went to the the FOS decision that I've uh, attached there, and they uh, looked through clauses two two one two two point two 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 twenty two point three, and then uh, the definition of a uh, all monies clauses amount owing. Mm -hmm. So you've so that, yes. informed yourself by reference to what Foz said about this? Uh, to my read, but I'm, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, what I would have done, and maybe that's the assumption I made to Mr Brandis earlier, what I would have done is gone to the legal team and had a look at this. Uh, I, I had a review of it at a high level and then also looked at Foz, and they were my two reference points to, to, to do that. Where do we see any evidence in the documents that anyone within the Bank of Melbourne considered whether the bank had a legal entitlement to act as it did <coughs> before it proceeded to act in that way? I don't see evidence of that. It didn't happen, did it, Mr Welsh? I, I don't see evidence of it. Well, can I... The, the decision to... Um, uh, act in this way, and when I say act in this yeah. way, I mean to quarantine the $100,000 yes. and, and keep it as collateral until yes. Mr and Mrs Wallace agreed to restructure the loan to what it should have been in yes. the first place. That was made by the credit team. Yes. You accepted that before. Yes. Uh, can I take you to um, a document recording that decision, which I'm sorry, I'll just find the reference for. Uh, WBC 4030027170. Thank you. Have I dated this? Yeah. This, uh, if I could ask you to look at uh, 7179 and if we could have 7180 on the screen next to it.
And do we see there at the second half of the page on the left hand side of the screen, Ronnie Sawani, the credit manager on the 5th of October 2017, um, approves a condition precedent, which we see as number three on the following page, is term deposit from sale proceeds for 100,000 to be taken as additional collateral until satisfactory commercial valuation is received with TAE within LVR of 65% is confirmed and or cash funds to be used to reduce overall TAE in line with LVR of 65%. That, that is the decision, that is the approval yes. um, to impose a condition precedent on the discharge of the mortgage which was made by Ronnie Sawani, uh, the credit manager, recorded in this document. Do you that agree is correct. with that? Yes, I do agree and with that. And do we see any consideration whatsoever in this document of whether there is a legal entitlement to take this action by reference to any of the contractual documents? No, I don't in this document. No, I don't. And do you accept from that that it didn't happen, Mr Welsh? There is no evidence for it in any of the documents. I don't know what happened. Well, I don't know how they informed themselves and there is no evidence. I, I, I accept there's no evidence, but I don't know what happened Well, I, I want to put to you, based yep. on my review of the documents, the same documents yep. you've read, that the bank decided what it wanted to do, which was to retain the $100,000, yes. and it decided to worry later about whether it had any legal entitlement to do that. I, I don't know whether that was the case. I, I can't see any... Well, I want to put to you squarely that the bank took advantage of the fact that um, Mr and Mrs Wallace needed the discharge of the mortgage on the Port Macquarie property, so time was of the essence, and they took advantage of that and pressured them to agree to the retention of the $100,000. The Port Macquarie sale was the trigger to review the facilities? Yep. Uh, I have, I have, there's no evidence on the files there. And you saw the uh, email from Mr Wallace where he said that he had felt pressured uh, to agree to this because of the need for the discharge of the Port Macquarie mortgage? I, I did. Yes. I tender this document, Commissioner. It hasn't gone in before. No, it's no. a separate document of a similar style to one I have already tendered, okay. Commissioner. Exhibit 3.68 will be uh, internal Bank of Melbourne uh, notes, uh, October 17, WBC. 4030027170 exhibit 3.68 Now I, I want you to put the very general statements made by FOS about this yep. to one side Mr yep. Wallace um, and I want you to I want you to have one more opportunity to answer my question about where in the documents that were provided to Mr Wallace uh, on the basis that they created a legal entitlement to do this, do we see that legal entitlement? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not a lawyer. I haven't reviewed them with that level of, with a legal eye. Um, I'm told that we can rely on them. I can't point to the clauses, I'm afraid. Very complicated clauses, aren't they, Mr Welsh? They are. And you yourself can't work out how they permit this to occur? I can follow at a high level, but I'd understand how it, it, it's too complex even for a, for a client. I, I do accept that. But you expected Mr and Mrs Wallace to understand how and why these documents entitled the bank to act in this way? Yes. Well, and that was an entirely unrealistic expectation when it proves to be so difficult that you can't articulate it, Mr Welsh. I think that's a that's a fair assumption that it's it's complex and difficult for clients mm -hmm. to read. Mm -hmm. and what I, I agree want to put with that. To you is that the clauses that um, FOS referred to in mm -hmm. in its determination um, were clauses that entitled the bank to use money received under one mortgage towards paying an amount owing 
Does this ring any bells with you? Yes, yes it does. Uh, and amount owing is defined in the uh, Memorandum of Provisions mm -hmm. at 4396. I'll take you to this, mm -hmm. uh, Mr Welsh, to mean... I'm sorry, and we're in the document that commences... We had it on the screen before. WBC 4030064386. The memorandum of provisions for the mortgage. <laughs> I just want to spend a small amount of time trying to understand this myself, yes. Mr. Welsh. The clause that Foz referred to was 22.1 at 4394. Uh, on 4394, which tells us that money received under this mortgage is to be used towards paying the amount owing, unless we are obliged to pay the money to anyone with a prior claim. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. Okay, and then 22.2, .2, if at the time we receive the money, any part of the amount owing is not then due for payment, we may retain amount an amount equal to that part. We must hold it in an interest-bearing account and use it to pay the amount owing when it becomes due for payment. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And amount owing is defined at 4396 to mean... I'll just wait till that comes up so you can follow this. Thank you. Do you see the reference to amount owing there? to mean at any time and subject to another clause, all money which one or more of you owe us or will or may owe us in the future. And then it includes various things. Now, these are the clauses that were referred to by FOS, and I just want to go back to clause 22.2. Do you say there was an amount owing to the bank? I believe that's what we say, yes. What was the amount owing? The amount owing was deemed to be under the other mortgage in this, in this case. OK. Uh, and that wasn't due for payment, is that right? Correct. So 22.2 .2 entitled you to retain an amount equal to that and you were required to hold it in an interest-bearing account, but you were then required to use it to pay the amount owing. You didn't do that, did you? Correct. You didn't retain the $100,000 to pay mm. to an amount owing on the buyer barra mortgage. Mm -hmm. You retained the $100,000 as a bargaining chip to get Mr and Mr. Mrs Wallace to agree to the restructure of the loan that you wanted because of the conduct of Mr Athanasopoulos back at the loan origination point. I'd agree with that. So these clauses did not support the action taken by the bank, did they? I'm not a lawyer, so oh. it's, it's, it's not my area of expertise on this. My team have told me that they did that. I've yeah. said this, my call is this is wrong. We shouldn't have done it. I understand. I've, I've said that in my statement. I thought we, we made an error and we shouldn't have passed that error on to our customer. I, I think we called it wrong. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure of all the detail of that, but we did. We got this, we got this wrong and passed that on to our customer, and that was a, the, a bad call by us. And do you accept that when you got it wrong, I want to be very clear about what you're accepting you mm -hmm. got wrong, because FOS, having had a look at these provisions, said that you had an entitlement to do this, but mm -hmm. that it was unfair for you to do this. And what I want to put to you is that it was not only unfair, but that you didn't even have an entitlement to do it. I don't know that. You don't know. I, I'm told that we did, but I'm I haven't. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, so I, I've been told that we we were able to do that, but it's not my area of expertise for the legal documents. Well, you are the person I have to ask these questions, Thank you. Mr. Welsh, mm -hmm. and I need to put them to you because you told me that your conclusions were informed by what Foz had done. And otherwise, you tell me you can't point to any clauses that entitled the bank to do what it did. Sorry, if I've misinformed you, I should correct myself. I was informed by 
two steps. Mm -hmm. The first is my own team reviewing these documents and saying we had the rights. When did that happen? Uh, in um, conversations with my internal legal team. When? When did that when? happen? As, as I was working through this, because I said, look, I, I asked similar questions to you, are we unable, are able to do that? And I'm told we were. And then for, to get myself a bit more comfortable, I looked at what FOS has done, and that gave me a second checkpoint. But, I, but when I looked at it, I still thought we shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And that was the wrong, wrong call by us. Yeah. Uh, by withholding the $100,000 from Mr and Mrs Wallace, the bank acted unfairly towards Mr and Mrs Wallace, didn't it? Yes, I think it did. Uh, and it was an abuse of the bank's power in its relationship with Mr and Mrs Wallace, wasn't it? Yes, I, I, I think, well, I, I agree we should not have done it. And do you agree it was an abuse of the power, the imbalance of power, which involved these complicated contractual documents and the pressure of time to discharge the mortgage? It was an abuse of power in the bank's relationship with Mr and Mrs Wallace. Well, from my review of the file, we didn't give the, there weren't many options for them. There, so there were no so, options, the, were there? Uh, agreed. So um, uh, that, that's how I, I read it, and I read it that we shouldn't have done that. And do you agree that the fair thing to do in this situation would have been to accept the position that the bank had created for the remainder of the loan term? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, when did the Bank of Melbourne release the $100,000 to Mr and Mrs Wallace? February. Mm -hmm. And why did the bank release it at that time? I think that they were going to sell the property. They were going to do one of two things. But they, they, had, were, they had sold the buyer back. They, they had, yeah. They were either going to get a revaluation or sell it. And at that point in time when we knew that, we, we released. It meant that there was no reason anymore to continue with the proposed restructure of that loan, didn't it? Yes, it did. Because they didn't ever agree to that proposed restructure, so you had retained the $100,000 until yes. that point. Yes. Okay. And FOS uh, found that the conduct of the bank was, in its words, inappropriate and unfair? Yes. And the bank accepted that finding? Yes, we did. And having accepted that finding, did the bank take any disciplinary action against any of the individuals involved in the decision to withhold the $100,000? I don't know that. Have you seen any evidence of any disciplinary action being taken against any of the individuals involved in that decision? No, no, I haven't. Uh, and if I, I haven't asked for it, though. Right. Do you think it would have been in the material you had reviewed if it existed? It could have been. Should there have been disciplinary action, Mr Welsh? I would have hoped there was a discussion with the team to, to look at what their thinking were and to, to review that. Well, should there have been disciplinary action? Well, it depends on what other facts they saw, what they did, they reviewed. It could depend on a lot of situations, but hard to... Well, well, I want to put to you the facts as we've been discussing them. The bank accepted that the conduct was unfair. Uh, I, sorry. The bank uh, accepted I, FOS's determination yes, that yes. the conduct was unfair. Well, sorry, I, I, I don't. I mean, we accept Foz's determination, and we made the payment. So that's what. And you've, that's you've what we said to me today in, that you accept that the conduct was unfair. And in my review of this file, mm -hmm. I think it was the wrong action. So have you asked whether or not any disciplinary action has been taken against the people who engaged in the unfair conduct? No, I have not. That conduct wouldn't be in line with the bank's values and behaviours, would it? Uh, it wouldn't be, in, in, in my view, but I haven't had a conversation with them, so it's hard to tell, their, uh, it's hard to tell what their uh, read of the situation was. Well, what do you think their read of the situation was, Mr Welsh? I don't know, because I haven't talked to them. Why not? Uh, I didn't uh, look to that to my, inform myself for, for, this, for preparation for this discussion. Do you think it would have been useful if you had, Mr Welsh? <laughs> I do now. Yes. <laughs> well, I want to put to you that this conduct wasn't consistent with the bank's obligation under the Code of Banking Practice to act fairly and reasonably towards its business customers in a consistent and ethical manner. 
I don't think we should have made that, made the judgment that we did. We should have released the money. I, we, I, we shouldn't have withheld the money. I understand I that, but I'd be grateful if you'd address my question, okay. which is whether or not you accept that that conduct is not consistent with the bank's obligation under the Code of Banking Practice to act fairly and reasonably towards its business customers in a consistent and ethical manner. If my, my view of, of that we didn't act fairly, yes, that's my view. Okay. And do you accept that it constituted misconduct within the definition of misconduct in your own misconduct and discipline reaction policy? Yes, it could have. Do you accept that it did? Well, I'd, I'd want to have a conversation with people. I can't... I, 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 I would want to sit down and hear their side of the version of it if, if we were going down that path. Mm -hmm. Well, we know from your... Uh, misconduct and disciplinary action policy, that misconduct includes failure to display Westpac group values and behaviours? Yes. Is that what this was? I I'd, I'd want to sit down and hear their, how they saw things. What, what, what do you think, what is it that you feel you're missing as part of the picture that would help you to answer these questions, Mr Welsh? Um, I I'm not 100% sure of the legal advice, so I would want to understand that legal advice and I want to work, I'd have a look at that. I'd also want to talk to the people of, of what their, how they were thinking through this and why they were, were taking that thing. I, I think it's fair to, to have a conversation with people and, and to logically work through and hear their, their story before you made a call on that, mm -hmm. on, on misconduct. Okay. Um, can I just turn briefly to the way that the Bank of Melbourne engaged with FOS as part of the FOS process. And could I ask mm -hmm. that you look at a document which is FOS 0015 0001 1179. This is a letter from FOS uh, to the Bank of Melbourne on the 14th of December 2017. Mm -hmm. So this is prior to FOS making um, its determination. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see a series of questions that FOS posed to the bank. And the fifth question was, what event triggered Bank of Melbourne to review the structure of Loan 1? How did Bank of Melbourne first discover the security was a commercial property? On what basis does it say it is a commercial property? You see that? Yes, I do. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Letter files to Bank of Melbourne, 14 December 17, FOS 0015-001-1179, Exhibit 3.69. And could I ask that you be shown um, the Bank of Melbourne's response to that letter, which is FOS 0015-001-0491. <coughs> And we see the answer to that question at paragraph five. On or about 23 June 2017, Mr Wallace requested we undertake valuations on both his Byabara and Port Macquarie properties as he wanted to determine how much equity could be leveraged. Initially believing both properties to be classified as residential, two residential valuations were ordered. On or about 10 July 2017, our panel valuer deemed that Byabara was classed as a commercial property and as such, a commercial valuation would be needed. Yes, I see that. Was that a full and fair answer to the question posed by FOS? Would it assist you if that mm. document was brought yep. up on the screen Thanks. again? Perhaps we okay. could have the previous document on the left-hand side so you can see the precise question that was asked mm -hmm. and this document on the right-hand side. Hmm. 
Was it a full and fair answer? No, I don't think it is. And why did your organisation not make a full and fair answer to FOS in the FOS process? I, I don't know why. You agree that the bank failed to properly disclose the extent of its knowledge about the characterisation of this property to FOS? Our banker knew, and there were records between the valuation, valuer that well, there was some debate around whether it was a, uh, by the banker, whether it was a whether it was a residential commercial, but in my view it was a commercial, so it should have been disclosed to FOS. And there's no reference to those earlier events and the earlier valuer's view at the origination time in the response to FOS, is there? Uh, that's a, that's a one-page letter. Yes, no, I don't, I don't see anything else. There should have been, shouldn't there? In my view, yes. Yes, um, but you can't offer any explanation for this? No, no, I can't. Um, was the Bank of Melbourne trying to minimise uh, the extent of its um, misconduct? I, I don't know. All right. I tender that second letter, Commissioner. Letter Bank of Melbourne to FOS, 19 December 17, FOS 0015 0010491, Exhibit 3.70. No further questions, Commissioner. As before, Mr Dark asks you any questions he may have. Mr Welsh, can I just go back to uh, this question about fairness, unfairness? Hmm. Let it be assumed that with all accounts, uh, mortgages, uh, the bank uh, had a right uh, to retain uh, the surplus uh, proceeds from the sale of the Port Macquarie property. Mm -hmm. Let that be the assumption. Mm -hmm. What exactly do you say is the unfairness that was worked to the client by insisting on that, retainer of the 100,000? Was the unfairness, well, they didn't have access to... to understand that, but why was it unfair of Bank of Melbourne to require, initially, uh, keeping of 100,000 in... Uh, term deposit? Oh, it was our mistake. In my view, it was our mistake. Uh, we made the mistake originally and our banker got it wrong. Therefore, we shouldn't have imposed that mistake on the client. We should have stood back and said to them, we've lent you uh, a higher amount than we should have, therefore you've taken on more risk and we should have had that conversation with them. But it was our mistake, so we shouldn't have imposed that on him. That's my view. The unfairness, can the unfairness be described as seeking to improve the bank's security position from the position uh, it had sought and obtained at time of original loan. Yes, it can. And, and, and I, can see, you know, I can see why our credit officers might have made that call. They might have sat back and looked at them, you've got a 30-year loan that's got a higher risk profile. This is a trigger that happens within business. Now would be a good time to talk about that and try to resolve it. I think it could have been done in a better way because we had, you know, he potentially was overexposed and they might have looked at some other things. So I can see why they were having those conversations, but it was our problem, our mistake. I understand that and uh, yep. I think you've conveyed that <laughs> Thank point. You. Thank you. It, it's the larger issue of, firstly, all accounts instruments, mm -hmm. whether they're all accounts mortgages or all yep. accounts guarantees all monies yep. uh, instruments, and cross collateralization generally. Firstly, in business lending, uh, cross collateralization, uh, coll cross, really is Friday, isn't it, Mr. Welsh? <laughs> <laughs> cross collateralizing <laughs> is commonplace. Yes, yes. Uh, so that you will have intersection between securities uh, and uh, particular lines of credit. Okay. Now, it's trying to get some understanding uh, of what you as hmm. a banker in your position think about 
a notion of fairness when it is applied to a transaction which begins with all money's instruments mm -hmm. cross collateralized how does fairness bite if at all uh, in cases of that kind I think we've seen over the last few days of our discussions that small business is pretty complex. And small business is complex because there's a range of entities. And there's also the personal side of being involved. We've had trusts. We've, had, um, we've also had companies. We've had guarantees. So it's a complex beast. And, and ironically enough, it's often more complex at the smaller end than, than at the bigger end, where you've got a standard corporate structure with all the right responsibilities, accountability, and well-intended people advising. So you've got this sort of messy situation going on. And our experience with businesses, you want to be able to look through that and be able to support you as they make dis decisions. Even if you look at this file here, there's a number of things going on. One moment he's keeping it, the next moment he's going to sell it. So there's lots of things going on, and they're changing. The benefits of the cross-collateralisation and the linking is that you've got more flexibility to move. What I would fear for small businesses is if you looked at it more like an individual home loan and had everything down one silo, and uh, there you'd only be looking at each silo in its own right. So there are some benefits both for the customer and also for the bank because it improves our risk position when, we've, when we look across them. So whilst on the face of it, the fairness of you might look at it and go, well, that's not fair. The intent is to provide more flexibility for clients, in my view. I understand that. And I just wanted to press you a little further, if I could. Firstly, all money's instruments are commonly used, aren't yes. they? Yes. And commonly used in small business uh, lending as they are in other forms of lending. Yes. Yes. And if all money's uh, instruments extend not only to uh, uh, what has been demanded but what uh, is contingently liable, uh, the reach of an all money's instrument can be very far. Do you accept that? I do. How, if at all, is a banker uh, to determine, by what criteria is a banker to determine whether insisting on the letter of the law and insisting on the letter of an all monies instrument is fair to the small business enterprise? What sorts of consideration can come to bear upon that? At a high level, I think what's important is that you give flexibility to the business and particularly for business, because they've got working capital. You give the business flexibility to be able to change and change their, change their requirements as their needs change. So you want to have that flexibility, because we've seen lots of transactions of things coming and going. So, so that's, pretty, that's very, very important. Now, the implications of that is you, you are more inclined to have all of all monies, all securities, and all locked up. So I think the trade-off is the fairness of the all monies with the flexibility that the business owner gets so that they can make calls because they're making calls daily on how they do things. They're looking at opportunities where they may want to buy more stock, do th things. So that flexibility. We're also seeing situations where businesses may have a number of entities. They might be buying and selling things within one entity and starting up new business or a new channel and often they do that through different companies. So it allows them an ability to look at the holistic nature of their business, albeit that they've got different legal entities and different structures. 
So I think there's a trade-off there between flexibility and, and fairness. And how much does the bank uh, need to inform the sm small business owner or operator these instruments you're signing are all money's instruments. Security number one supports security yep. number two, supports debt number one, supports debt number two, supports uh, facility number four, etc. My view is usually business owners are reasonably informed. They don't know all the details, reasonably. What is clearly evident... The first though, time I've heard of small business owners being across all money's instruments, Mr Welsh. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I would accept that. But what, I think they understand that... And, you, and I've heard you talk to this before. They, I understand that when they're going into the business, they're looking to the good times. They're looking, I'm, I've got the good story here, I'm backing myself, I'm bulletproof. They are looking to the future. They're not going through the all money's calls and goes, what if something goes wrong? Now, they know that if something goes wrong... In my experience, that there's implications for that. They know when we take all money guarantees to the level when we've got security, they know that they have to back themselves because they're taking on big risks. And the, the, they know that. Are they alive to them as much and are they alive to them as the details? I'm not sure. You could say one of the outcomes here would be you want to be a lot more detailed and you want to add and explain a lot more. That would add some complexity for them. And I think you want to be very thoughtful about the trade-off there because my pick is they're still going to back themselves and go, I've got a great idea and I'm here. Now, we want to support them, yeah. but we don't want to add more complexity to them. So it's a, it's a very nuanced trade-off that needs to be thought deeply about. And, I, and probably the last thing is I, am, I don't want our bankers making too many of the judgment calls on, on what they should or shouldn't do. You know, we need a set framework to be very clear and I want our clients to be informed. I want them to understand what they're getting into because that's absolutely critical. But I also want them to be able to operate their businesses and, and, and go for the things they want to go for. Yes, yes. Mr. Dark. Oh, sorry, Ms. Orr, is there anything arising out of that? Mr. Dark. Um, Commissioner, may I just indicate two matters before Mr. Welsh leaves the witness box? First, um, in relation to the information that the bank provided to FOS concerning the term deposit dispute, if I can use that language, there, there are some documents that have been provided to council assisting uh, but that aren't part of Mr Welsh's statement um, that bear on that issue. We will identify them for council assisting and I expect they'll be able to be tendered by consent. Um, secondly, earlier on in his oral evidence, Mr Welsh referred to a Bank of Melbourne policy concerning the valuation of security properties. Uh, if we can identify that policy and it is of relevance to the Commission's inquiry, again, we'll identify that for council assisting and I imagine it can be tended by consent. But I'm not in a and position it, to read it's down. It's late in the day to be pulling out new policies, Mr Dark. I mean, I, I'm not going to anticipate what <coughs> happens when we get to it, but uh, I thought that uh, uh, you were asked to produce the uh, applicable policies and it leaves me in a very awkward position if later you come along and say, oh, no, it's not, here's another applicable policy, I've lost Mr Welsh out of the box, he hasn't heard anything, what am I meant to make of it all? It, it's a policy that was referred to and I think exhibited to a statement that Mr Welsh prepared in respect of rubric 3.3, which ultimately wasn't required well, to be finalised. If it is put it to him, Mr Dark, Mr Welsh is in the box now. Uh, well, uh, to be uh, fair to him, to be fair to the bank, to be fair to everybody who's interested in this, uh, we've got to draw this to an end. You, you, uh, Commissioner, I, I entirely accept that and I'm not seeking to prolong the, the matter. I was no, hoping to deal with it more. I'm just concerned that we know that we have a, 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 a identified field. So if there's yes. another policy you need to put to him, put it to him. Yeah, well, I'll endeavour to do it now. I'm not sure whether it's the policy that uh, Mr Welsh had in mind and it's not uploaded to the system, so I'll have to provide a paper copy if I may.
uh, Mr. Welsh, do you see there that you have a document headed consumer lending lending policy? Yes, I do. And, and could I ask you to turn through to page um, uh, 8414 using the numbering in the top right hand corner? And do you see section 19.3.3 .3 on that page? Yes, I do. And that provides for the valuation of real estate in certain circumstances by reference to the purchase price in a, in a contract of sale? Yes, it does. Is this the policy that you were referring to uh, when you were asked by a council assisting about uh, policies for the valuation of security? Yes, this was the one I was referring to. Yes. Well, I'll tender that policy, if I may, Commissioner, and we'll have it uploaded to the system in due course. 3.71 will be uh, George Consumer Lending Lending Policy, WBC 05003482982. January 2009 seems to be the currency date. Do you accept that, Mr. Well? I do. Thank you. Yes. yes. There's nothing further in reason. Yes. Ms. Orr? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, you have that document in front of you still, Mr. Welsh. Yes, 8414 I do. is open. Do you see there that this applies to newly proposed residential security property? Do you see? Help, no, help me, please. Where I'm are sorry, from? under the heading 19.3.3, .3, purchase yep. price, contract of sale, purchase price, real estate valuation methods, yep. it says the purchase price in a contract of sale, excluding the value or cost of chattels, furnishing, and any rebates or incentives offered by the vendor, may be used to determine the security value for a newly proposed residential security property where certain criteria are met. Is that what it says? Yes, it does. This wasn't a residential security property. We've got to that point, haven't we, Mr Welsh? Oh, I agreed. Yes, so yes. this policy didn't apply to the valuation of this property. Yes, and I thought you were, at the time, taking me through the residential security policy which allowed a contract to sale. That other policy that you annexed as part of your statement applied to both commercial and residential securities, didn't it? Yes. And is that why you annexed that policy to your statement <coughs> rather than this policy? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Good. Yes, thank you very much, Mr Welsh. You may step down and I think you are now excused. Further Thank you, Commissioner. Those words you have been longing to hear. <laughs> you are right. <laughs> For once. <laughs> Ms Orr. Commissioner, the next case study involves Suncorp and we'll start with a consumer witness. Could we have a moment to reset yes, the bar I table? come back shortly before midday. Thank you, Commissioner.